Janine Vaughan was a petite 31-year-old woman who lived in a small inland town of Bathurst in New South Wales, Australia, about 200 kilometres west of Sydney. She had moved there from the Hunter Valley after following her boyfriend to the small town before they both broke up and she remained in the area for three years. She was friendly and always ready for a laugh. She had a close-knit group of friends and had a job as a manager at a menswear shop. After midnight, in the early hours of Friday the 7th of December 2001, she went out with friends drinking and dancing at a local nightclub called the Metro Tavern. After they left the nightclub at 3.47am, it was raining and Janine was seen walking 40 metres ahead of her group of friends along Keppel Street Bathurst near Mechady Park at 3.50am that morning. Whilst walking, only a few minutes after leaving the nightclub, a mid to late 1990s medium-sized bright four-door sedan vehicle was seen completing a U-turn and pulled up alongside her. She was then seen entering the front passenger seat of the car, which looked similar in size and shape to a Mitsubishi Magna or Toyota Camry. The car took off and Janine was never seen or heard from again. When Janine failed to show up for work in the Bathurst shopping centre in the morning, she was reported missing by her employer. Police conducted an extensive search on a number of areas around the Bathurst vicinity that weekend for further clues that might help solve her disappearance. For 19 years, police have been investigating what happened to Janine, but to no avail. Her body has never been found. Her family and friends describe Janine as fun-loving and outgoing, and always willing to help others. She was a social person, she liked going out to meet people, and she liked to drink. It's believed that she would have never entered a car unless it was someone that she trusted. The suspect would have been someone that was familiar to her, around her shop, around town, or a person that she met at the club. The night she vanished, she had no money, no phone, and no key to get into her house or any other belongings with her. A cleaner at the nightclub found a handbag jammed in the corner of the bathroom the next day. The cleaner told the authorities and the media that he remembered the bag because it looked like someone had deliberately hidden it by putting packets of chips in front of it. About 10 minutes before Janine was seen getting into the car, another woman was approached about 750 metres away by a man in what was believed to be the same vehicle. The investigation has been filled with leads and misleads, but ultimately no person has ever been convicted in relation to the case. A 2009 coronial inquest concluded that someone most likely took her life. In mid-September of 2009, a man by the name of Dennis Briggs came forward and admitted to stabbing her and burying her body in the white rocks. As he told the police his story, his eyes were fixed as if he was reliving the moment. After revealing the information, it was discovered that he had a bipolar condition and he didn't have his medication at the time of the confession. He retracted his statement and declined doing it. Altogether, 47 people were interviewed, false leads were provided, and all suspects were ultimately cleared. The coroner declared, The only available conclusion is that Janine Vaughan disappeared, and that someone took her life by person, or persons unknown, and her body disposed of in such a way that it has not been found. We can only hope one day, some evidence will emerge, and provide that answer. In 2019, the New South Wales government announced a $1 million reward for information which leads to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for the disappearance of Janine Vaughan. On the 26th, August, 1979, a family entered the chilly Rocky Cave, located near Dubois, Idaho. They went in searching for arrowheads, but instead made a horrifying discovery. They found a headless torso. It was wrapped in a burlap sack and buried in an 18 inch deep grave. The torso was of a man, but the identifying of the remains was very difficult since there was no head to go with the body. The man's remains were well preserved and there was skin on the body. Fast forward to 1991, a 12 year old girl went exploring in the same cave and found more remains. This time it was a partially buried mummified hand. The find brought forensic investigators to the scene. 
It was thought that the man was of European descent and estimated that he would have been about 40 years of age. Further excavations followed and his limbs were also found wrapped in a burlap sack. They also made an unusual discovery while searching the area. They unearthed the remains of an ostrich which would have made its way there from a local ostrich farm. Over the years, improved technology revealed some information about the body, such as age and height. But without a head, the case went cold until last year. DNA Doe Project and experts from a tech company called Othram that sequences DNA became involved. Genologists then built a genealogical tree, which led to a huge breakthrough. Scientists were finally able to put an identity to the remains. It was confirmed by law enforcement officials, police records, and via comparison with a living grandchild. It was determined that the remains belonged to outlaw Joseph Henry Lovelace, who was born on the 3rd of December, 1870, in Payson, in the Utah Territory. He was brought up by parents who were pioneers of the Latter-day Saints movement. In 1899, at the age of 28, he married Harriet Savage in Salt Lake City, with whom they had one daughter. Five years later, Harriet filed for divorce on grounds of desertion and failure to support their child. By August 1905, he married Agnes Caldwell. They then lived in Idaho and had four children from 1906 to 1913. He was arrested in 1914 for bootlegging, but he repeatedly escaped jail using a small saw blade he hid in his shoe to cut through the bars. In March 1916, he was arrested again for the same offense, but managed to stop the train that was escorting him to jail and fled. On the 5th of May 1916, he took his wife's life with an axe while they stayed in a tent together. He was arrested and sent to prison. At her funeral, one of their children was quoted saying, Papa never stayed in jail very long and he'll soon be out. On May 18, 1916, he broke out of prison, once again using a saw blade. It remains a mystery how his life ended, but some believe it may have been a revenge attack by a family member. It was determined that multiple sharp instruments were used to separate his body parts. The clothes described in his wanted poster, after his jailbreak, described him wearing the same clothes found with his remains, which were a light colored hat, brown coat, maroon sweater, pink shirt with blue overalls, over black trousers. The forensic genealogist with the DNA Doe project speculated that based on the style of clothing, it's believed his life was taken just after his last jail escape in 1916. A photo composite of Loveless was also created from photographs of his immediate family members and the physical description on his wanted poster. His skull has never been found. 